All right, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, sorry for the hiatus in the uh, Q&A sessions that we've been having over the last few weeks, but uh, happy to report that we're now back in action and uh, aiming for to continue a weekly schedule. Um, not sure of the day exactly, but sort of going to be a bit floating, but we'll just say on a weekly schedule. Uh, anyway, uh, I'd like to introduce our guest this evening, who is acclaimed uh, saxophonist uh, Igor Fedotov. Uh, now, Igor uh, has a rap list of accolades and performances uh, so big, it's really hard to sort of whittle down. But I can uh, report that he has played with some amazing musicians, such as Ingelbert Humperdinck, uh, The Cockroaches, Branford Marsalis, uh, Modern Talking, Ken Davis. And uh, I believe he's also worked with the TC band, which is referred to as Taking Care of Business, uh, uh, which is what Elvis Presley had actually called the band. Um, and we've got a lot of other things to talk about with Igor tonight, but um, I'll just uh, keep my intro very brief and we'll let the man himself talk. So this evening, I'd like to send a warm welcome out to Igor. Thank you, Igor, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Nathan. Great to be here. Uh -huh. It's cold outside. It's good to be inside. Ah, oh, sure is. <laughs> Um, so, look, I'll just start nice and easy, like uh, with all our guests. Um, I just simple question, just to sort of get the ball rolling. What was it that made you decide to pick the saxophone, saxophone out of all the instruments out there? Good question. Um, well, to put it uh, simply, I've been conned to play <laughs> into <laughs> saxophone. My friend, um, I used to play, when I was about 10 and 11, I used to play bass and drums. Um, I still love those instruments, but... When I was about 12 or 12 and a half, my friend said, hey, I'm going to sign up uh, for a music course. In Russia, you can't have a, uh, at that time, uh, back in USSR, mm. you couldn't have a private lessons. You would go and go to an institution called music school, where you have, um, where you have um, like a five or six subjects a week. You have a 45 minutes of your saxophone lesson, 45 minutes compulsory called general piano. Then you will have a salfeggio, then you will have a uh, music history and music theory. And then yeah, that's five subjects. And when you get older, like maybe three or four years later, you'll choose your second instrument, either clarinet or uh, flute. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, he went and he was signing up for, for saxophone because mom bought him a very nice saxophone. I was there just hanging around. And lady said, and what are you doing? I said, well, I want to play drums or bass, well, drums, yeah. Uh, because I thought I might get girls that way, you know. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, I just said, look, sign up for the saxophone as well, because we are short on the sax players. And later on, we will transfer you. Well, six months later, my friend gave up on saxophone, and I stayed there and continued. And that's how it. So I started on a on a clown, uh, on a saxophone. I had my first instrument was soprano saxophone for six months, until my parents, because the school gave me a soprano sax. They didn't have anything else. Uh, and then um, my parents bought me an alto saxophone. That's that's how it all started. So I've been content to playing saxophone. Wow. <laughs> I would be drama. I would be good drama. <laughs> I can keep the beat. <laughs> well, it's, it's certainly a good thing you actually got to the saxophone because you have some uh, incredible musical output on the instrument. Um, now, just sort of going on. Uh, so you're originally from Russia, uh, and that's where, obviously where your musical journey began. Um, you studied, uh, you just mentioned that you studied at the College of Arts there. Um, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, that's, uh, that's, it's um, <laughs> the, the Russian way is a bit convoluted. So you have, when you're uh, young, you start with the music school. Yep. So you have, a, if, you, if you're like really young, you have a seven year course. If you're okay. older, you have a five year course. So I had to, because I was too old for that, I had to finish course in three years. Five year course in three years. So I did it. Um, and then you go to uh, college at uh, the four years, and then you go to five years, conservatorium of music. So I've done all of these three steps. And um, I started as a, as a funny thing. I, I started as a, a saxophone player, but then I've been conned again. So after year, um, say if I compare to Australia, say, so year 11, I'm in year 11, finishing year 11. And my friend says, hey, they're in college. Uh, they run, they're very short on, on, on clarinet players. And I played clarinet already by then a little bit. And he said, do you want to skip the HEC and go straight away to the college? I said, yeah, sure. I don't want to stay in HEC, you know, doing HEC. So I went and uh, signed up for the clarinet. So I did about 
three and a half years, they promised me that they're going to open saxophone class. It didn't happen, obviously. Mm -hmm. They called me again. So I went, then about three and a half years later, I go to the head of uh, that college and I'm going, you're going to open a saxophone class. I said, what? I said, you promised me two and a half years ago that you're going to, no, we're not going to, we don't have a teacher. I said, no, nah, my teacher is fine. You can do me. No, 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 you will fail. I said, no, I'm not going to fail. I'm going to do well. And anyway, they allowed me, I'm actually opened the class of the saxophone at that uh, institution. It's called now Institute of something. Um, probably the same, the culture. I don't know what it's called. But anyway, so I opened the class there. No one before me played the saxophone there. And then um, my teacher was teaching me a classical saxophone. So I'm, I, I did a classical course and I had an outside uh, a teacher who was teaching me jazz. Um, and my classical saxophone teacher didn't know about it because otherwise he'll get pissed off and because, the, you know, you ruin your ambition with the jazz yeah, chops yeah. and everything. Yeah. So I kept it secret. Um, and... Uh, that's how I, I sort of went sa clarinet, saxophone, clarinet, saxophone. And it was, my education is classical, classical saxophone, classical clarinet. But on the side, I was uh, doing the jazz and all the and other stuff, pop okay. music and rock and roll. Wow. All the gigs. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's the... So many bit different of a, hats. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh, cool. So um, uh, obviously, um, yeah, so it sounds like you had a very uh, diverse... Uh, education there and it sort of mm. came in very handy for you to sort of get on the scene and start working um, when you were uh, sort of had finished your studies or maybe even towards the end of your studies uh, I'm sure you would have had a few interesting uh, highlights in terms of performance experiences or gig highlights that stand out is there anything that you recall look when I when you study like when we started back then when we mm. started in Russia you full-time so you, you can't work because right. you, uh, you're, at, you're at your university or college you for six days, Monday to Saturday. You start at 7.30, finish maybe three or four. So you play at nighttime. You find your gigs, the weddings. I played a clarinet in a um, local, um, it's called operetta, not opera, but operetta, like the opera. Yeah. So I played clarinet there in a pit. And that's when I made a decision not to learn flute. <laughs> because I knew I play clarinet, I play saxophone. If I start learning flute, I will get the gigs and I don't want these gigs. So Clarinet and say I deliberately didn't learn the flute. Anyway, that, so that's what I was doing. And I also played um, during summer, there was a lot of uh, international tourists, especially from Germany. So three months they go and they go on the, on the ships, on the boats, on the tourists, you know, the cruise ships mm. on the river. Um, and I used to play on the, on the ships as well. That was a good time. It's a lot of young girls and stuff like that. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> it was good times, you know, I was young. Yeah, 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 of course. All right, um, cool. All right, so it sounds like, um, yeah, it was a uh, yeah, very exciting time for you. Uh, now, obviously you had a wealth experience over there and then at some stage you eventually came to Australia. Um, I believe you came here, oh, it was about 20 years ago. 1992. 1992. So so before that, I, I, let me tell you what's happened before I came to Australia. So okay. I, when, once I finished the con, um, I went and played two years, no, one and a half years in a symphony orchestra as a clarinet player. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting and looking at these ladies, old ladies sitting there and the knitting and rehearsals and everybody whinging about the conductor, the usual stuff. And I'm sitting there younger, I'm thinking, Am I going to play this until I will be retiring? No way. So I had a short hair, so I grew the long hair, took my saxophone and started doing the uh, big gigs went, uh, in Moscow. So I started playing the, um, it, basically in show business. So I was a musical right. director for, um, and a saxophonist for two Russian pop stars, um, okay. male and female. And we did a lot of gigs. Um, yeah, all gigs was if I played like for one thousand people, that was a pretty small gig. Wow. Um, yeah, the, we had to employ twelve people. We had a, a two full size trailers, sort of like a coal trailers. We had a sixty thousand watts PA, so we traveled. I had about twenty gigs a month. So we would travel all the eleven time zones in Russia, and you know that was a great life. Wow. And the, you know the um, bodyguards, nice cars, and all this stuff with the, what comes with the pop stars. 
Wow. Sounds that was a good one. Yeah. And good. then I and then um, I came to Australia in nineteen no in nineteen ninety. We just came here to trail or just to visit our friends mm -hmm. in Aubrey Vodonga. And we went everywhere. We went, we've seen the rural Australia mostly. We, we went to Sydney and Melbourne, but we love the uh, country towns like, you know, I don't know, Yakadenda, Dadar, Dadarang, and all of those ones. Mm -hmm. And we fell in love, uh, we fell in love with um, uh, just the simple people, how people, we love the people here. So when then we went back to Russia, it was 1990, 1990, right at the end of 1990. And all of this uncertainty started there, you know, the coup and all of this stuff. And I remember I was going to record, we were going to a recording studio at night, like eight o'clock. And there was a tanks on the streets going towards the White House, towards the Kremlin. Yeah, right. And um, I'm thinking, listen, I might have a small brain of a musician, but I know it's taken them 20 to 30 years to sort of these things out. I don't have that time. I just simply don't have the time to give it to them. So. I said to my wife, let's go to the embassy. We went uh, em to, to Australian embassy and asked for independent immigration. And because we had a nice papers from here, from government and from some friends here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we just got an independent immigration visa and got our permanent residency before we even left Moscow. So it was good time for us. And then in February, 29th of February, 1992, we arrived here, we landed here. And we we'll love this country, the best country in the world. Oh. Keep it secret. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So it sounds like you got out of there um, just in the nick of time with um, everything going on during that time. In yeah. Time. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, moving countries is a big change for a lot of people. Um, and uh, it's even harder, particularly if, you know, you're sort of new in a country and you're trying to get into the music scene here. Um, could you tell us, uh, firstly, uh, how did you, what were sort of the differences that you found between the Australian music scene or the Sydney music scene in comparison to what you were used to back in Russia? And could you also tell us about sort of how you got yourself involved in, in the scene? Like how did you sort of network and what was sort of your method of getting and breaking into the scene? Okay. Um, well, the difference is, as we discussed before the interview, I came from a concert scene to a gig scene. So in, in Russia, like you work, it's almost full-time job. No, it's actually, it was a full-time job. Uh, there's no, it wasn't a gig for me. It was like, I was employed by these people, not employed in a way that they would put me, play, pay my salary. Mm. Cause it was like, you know, you paid per gig, basically. Whatever we make, we, you know, depends where you work. If you work 20,000 study, uh, you know, the uh, place, then you get one amount of money. Then if you play a thousand, it's different, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't like, oh, we need these musicians for this gig. No, it was like you're permanently working with them. You go on the television every week, your appearances, you know, all of this stuff. And when I came here, remember, I played with, I just started with, um, when we arrived in 29th of February and about May, I started working with Buddy Holly Show. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh man, we're playing this big gig. We're doing this, you know, blah, blah. I'm thinking, whoa, well, okay, I better get ready. So I dressed up and coming and everything. And I look at the place and it's St. George Leagues Club, like 500 seats. I'm thinking, I have to scale down. Okay. And then that's when I start thinking, I have to start teaching. Because coming back, you know, from a, like really arenas, basically coming to the, you know, 500 people in a place and people saying that's a big, I'm thinking, okay. All right, learn. Well, uh, Nathan, uh, about how did I, um, got a, you know into this music scene in sydney um i think when you interviewed stefan mm. he said there used to be a uh, newspaper called drum media yep yeah and the back page we used to go and find who is wants to so i've got all the gigs i i find my five found my um gigs through um friends um when we arrived here we stayed uh for one month in albury Vodonga. then we uh, moved to sydney and we have a friend his name is Robert Della. Mm. Rob Della, um, he, um, he now lives in, in Melbourne, but he used to be a, a music teacher at uh, Newington. Okay. So he introduced me to the teacher's world, like, you know, the music school, because I've got my, um, I've been teaching at PLC Pimble. I arrived on 29th of February and I've been teaching at PLC from the 4th of April. It's, uh, when they, yeah, I've been wow. there for nearly 30 years now. 
Um, so I've done all of the shows, like the Cockroaches, the Van Morrison show, the Cher show, and all of those ones. But a lot of them I found through the newspaper. It used to okay. be a great thing that people, knew, there wasn't any internet. So you yeah. advertise in the newspaper, if you need sax players, and back then the sax, sax players were in demand. I had a residency in Malabar RSL, uh, Friday, Saturday night. Good pay, they even paid us um, traveling money, like a petrol money. Wow. They give you dinner, drinks, and paid good money, cash, and they give you the, the petrol money. How good was that? You know? Yeah, you're lucky to get any of those things these days. Oh, no, <laughs> yeah. And uh, then what's happened, um, I started traveling with Buddy Holy Show. We went to Singapore, Bali, everywhere, we were traveling a lot. And I looked at the Asia Pacific and I'm thinking, whoa, these people like this music. So in 1998, I decided to uh, release my album. But I've always been interested in recording, you know, stuff. Mm. Because in Russia, I used to be I spent days in recording studios um, and just hanging around the sound engineers, what they do. I like the sound. And, and by the way, I came in Russia, I came from school that concentrates like there were the two schools, so St. Petersburg and Moscow. So St. Peter, St. Petersburg is more sound and emotions, whereas the Moscow is a show off, you know, playing fast and you know, mm. jolly kind of. So I came from that sort of a different uh, school. Um, the technique is important, but it's not as important as what you're trying to, you know, say or play uh, and how you play it. And uh, when I um, came here, I played a lot of shows and. Uh, I was, you know, I played some great gigs, some rubbish gigs, but I played. And I've I always been happy. Like, I'm, I'm a happy person in, in general. So I never said no. Sometimes we had to travel a lot, you know, and sometimes you travel like on a on a train to some pub somewhere, you know, but, you know, coming back at two o'clock on the, on the train as well. And it was a experience for me. But, I'm, you know, I came from Moscow, you know. Nothing was, you know, that city was small for me. Yeah. Compared to Moscow, so it was different. Uh, but it, I, it, it was a very, um, was a different music scene in Sydney. If you wanted to play, if you want to play ten gigs, not a problem. With it. You can get ten gigs easily. Mm -hmm. Plus, you're teaching, you know, if you want to. Wow. Yeah, it certainly sounds like a, a different time for sure. And yeah, it's yeah, a lot different. very different. Yeah. Um, well, you, you sort of mentioned before that uh, when you were touring with the, the Buddy Holly show, um, actually, funnily enough, I, I work with the, the other Buddy Holly show. So that's another story for I another think time. I, I think I did a gig uh, in the one you played as well, maybe one or two gigs, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know there's a, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, just sort of going back to that that tour uh, and going to uh, Southeast Asia and visiting those countries and uh, you sort of gave you a bit of an inspiration uh, and that sort of ties in nicely. Well, I was going to ask you about the, the release of your solo, your debut solo album uh, in 1998, uh, which was entitled Igor. Um, it obviously had a, it was a bit of a milestone for you as a musician. Um, maybe you could talk about sort of what in particular it was about that recording project and the songs on that album that sort of really sort of made it a turning point for you musically. Look, uh, Nathan, I have a, um, I have a kind of a two heads. Mm -hmm. One is a musician and another one is an accountant. When I look at, at that uh, time, I look, what music makes money? I'm thinking, Kenny G plays that stuff. Man, it's easy. I can do that too. So I thought, okay, I play the gigs here and the jazz gigs and played a lot of, you know, the Soup Plus. We used to have a jam sessions there. I used to hang out with Bobby Gabbard and I used to take uh, lessons on the jazz harmony with him and we played with the, all the, you know, the, 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 after midnight you go to the basement, you hang out there. So it was a, a lot of, but I see that, I, I looked at jazz musicians and I see that they not doing really well financially. So I said, nah, I can do better than that. So I decided, okay, I'll just uh, do this, you can call it cheesy music or emotional music, whatever, whatever people like. Mm -hmm. I'm not the one who decides you know, what people like. Anyway, I had a, uh, in my bedroom, I was sharing with my son, he was little then. I bought a 16-track uh, Roland, whatever it was, a 16-track recorder. I had a keyboard, I had a computer, and um, 
I did the whole album myself. I was friends who played the keyboard, you know, keyboards and guitars and everything, percussion. And uh, I mixed it myself. And uh, I, no, I didn't master it, but someone did it for me. And yeah, and I start, I thought, oh, what I'm going, okay, I released the album. It was very expensive back then to release an album. So, and I think that somebody told that somehow the Sony um, knew about that, um, that I released the album. Somebody gave them my album and they invited me for, you know, talking. And they're talking, well, look, you sound like a sort of like a Kenny G sort of music. You're very emotional, very, you know, uh, easy listening. Uh, we might sign you up. I said, okay, good. Here's my account on head. What numbers are we talking about? And they go, oh, if it goes platinum, 50,000, you know. I said, and what do I get? Remember the CDs were 30 bucks. Right. They said, oh, you don't get $1.50. I'm like, oh, 75 grand a year. Hmm, that's not bad. And that's why I did a fatal mistake. I just told, told them, let me think about it. Mm. You have to see their faces. They <laughs> turn green or red. <laughs> Who do you think you are to think we are Sony, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I did a good decision because I made much more than $75,000 out of that album. Wow. Um, you, you, we used to have... Um, center stage in a shopping centers mm -hmm. where the musicians used to play so i would go there and play um i used to have a pair of speakers uh mixer just the cds backing tracks uh for my album mm -hmm. i had a radio microphone the first ones back then and my wife would sit and uh, sell the cds okay if i didn't sell in one session 50 cds that was a bad day that's a 1500 bucks per day in 1998 mm -hmm. and i was doing it seven days a week Jeez. Yeah, we did very well with the first CD. Um, and then the second one was good too. But then, you know, then I start traveling overseas. I went, um, I opened my um, rec small record label called Figaro Music. Mm -hmm. And we went, we start traveling to Midem, which is in Cannes, in France. The same place where the movie festival is called yeah, yeah, yeah. Palace the Festival. Anyway, and it's a, it's a big, it's once a year, you go to the, in January, I think it's like, mid-January or end of January and you hang around with all of the independent record labels big ones and you try to make a deal so after six days of that you lose like two or three or four or five kilos because you you do like 12, 12 hours walking constant meetings constant meetings and you have to be not only music you're not musician there you represent I wasn't representing my music I was I was representing my music but I wasn't it because if you think about your music, you can't sell it. I was a salesperson. Right. And I signed a lot of contracts in Southeast Asia. I, I was the first one, one, one with them, I remember I was the first one to sign with the Times Music, which is the biggest company in India. Mm -hmm. um, and I signed with them. We just arrived first day and I signed it in the morning. And then that's how I start also going to India as well, Bollywood and all of these places. Right. So the, um, and then I signed, I had a, I had a, I think, company Orange Music in Singapore. We had a 26 shops selling my music uh, in Singapore alone. And then all, I, I signed with um, China Records Corporations, which is the biggest one in China as well. Mm -hmm. You still can buy my fake CDs in China. Wow. And <laughs> I actually, a few years ago, I went, it's funny, I went to um, local, um, there's a Carlingford, uh, Oh, like a Chinese music. village. No, it's a Chinese uh, shopping center. Oh, okay. Anyway, I was buying something there, and I look at a CD shop, and I walk in, and there's a CD, and I'm taking that CD. I go to counter, and, and she says, "Oh, that's you." I said, "Yeah," and you're selling my fake CDs. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> wow. So he was here with the fake CDs. So it was a good time. Listen, that was a good time. With the live gigs and then cds came along man we did doing very well we were selling and then i signed a contract with local company called uh, holborn music remember when you go to like um national geographics or airport there used to be like a stance where you press the um, uh, button and there's like an ambient music or whatever it was mm -hmm. a lot of those ones uh, okay. yeah, yeah i signed with them it was a good time as well and then cds uh stopped selling Benito. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that was the last thing. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, that's sorry. It's no, a bit no, long no. story, but 
<laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's an interesting story for sure. And um, look, that sort of uh, ties in with the next question as well really nicely. So, I mean, you, you've you talked about how you sort of put on various different hats as not only as a performer, but also, you know, composer, uh, sound engineer, um, and also just general business and accounting and all that stuff as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's those are really important attributes to have as a musician because it's not just, you're not just, it's nah. not just about playing music. It's also the business side. You can't well. survive these days just doing the one thing, you know. Yeah. It's so, very um, hard to survive. No, for sure. And just sort of in that uh, sort of vein as well, like just for like people sort of coming onto the music scene now or um, sort of young musicians, you know, fresh out of uni and, you know, they're looking to sort of, you know, make a dent on the scene and uh, make a career out of music. Like what sort of advice would you sort of provide for those musicians today on what they should be looking at doing? No, I don't want to advise anyone on anything, but I tell you what, I don't like this word career in music. Okay. I did it for the heck of it. I just love the music. I did it. When you do it, it's like going to business. If you're going to make a money, you will. You never will make it. If you're going to make a difference or you want to make a statement or something, then the money will come along. Money will come along. It is mm -hmm. not, money is not a problem. My, uh, if you're not having fun while you're doing it, when I was young, I, that's, that's all I want to do. I didn't want to do anything else except music. And I did. I used to, even when I was studying at uni, um, we started at 7.30 because my teacher would come at 8 and he would kill me if I didn't practice, no warm up before, <laughs> literally. I still keep on in contact with him. He's turned 75 a couple of days ago, I rang him. He lives in America now. Oh, wow. And um, I always had a good teachers. Yeah. That's, the, that's the thing I was blessed with as a good teachers and the friends and the mentors. Anyway, and uh, I think that these days, if you just start thinking, oh, how much my hex will be, how much is this? I mean, you're already failing. You're already failing. What is mu music? If, if you want to be a, a musician, dude, for the heck of it. If you want to make money, go into real estate, go to the business, go, go to the stock exchange, go do whatever you want. Money is there. Money is not, money is not difficult to make. Mm. But if you want to be a real musician and you want to make a, a, a life as a musician, just do it. You know, just do it, and, and, and it's a long way. It's a long way to the top. A lot of musicians don't uh, want, like, you know, by the age of 20, they want to have this and 25, this. No, this won't happen. You might look at the, um, who was that guy, in Cuban guy? Um, forgot his name, but the, he'd been discovered when he was 78. Yeah, He right. just made it. Wow. And he, you know, that Buena Vista, uh, Buena Vista, something club oh, Buena Vista social club social club yeah that mm. guy who plays the the piano okay they discovered when he was 78 that's the first gig like a first breakthrough he made him so sometime you have to wait you know yeah and you not a good advice but I can't you know I can't advise because this whenever I, what I think now there's so many opportunities but you have to be extra creative you can't just go and learn the saxophone and that's it that's what I'm going to do well you have to be bloody good to, to make it now in a, uh, in this scene because there's so many people who are good and they don't make any business just because they don't have another qualities that uh, come you know you should have when you're um, in the entertainment industry. Mm. Yeah, no, certainly some good points, and I think you know this one of the things you sort of highlighted is having that um, passion for music, and you know just sort of if as long as you've got that, that can sort of really help you. Keep you going. I still have the passion. I tell you what, about um, six months ago, I had a client coming to my studio and I do like um, what they call a, a library music. Mm -hmm. Library music means you do the commercials and it goes around the world. You're, I, have a two, um, I have a two publishers and they do the legwork. Yep. Um, I, not, I don't play the saxophone, I just do the computer programming and stuff like that. But um, anyway, I had a client and he come and said, oh, listen, I need this commercials. Um, I said, when do you need it? He said, well, literally yesterday. Right. I said, whoa, okay. So, he, and it was, anyway, um, to cut it short, I had to work 48 hours straight in my studio, no stopping. Um, and it's, uh, it was fun. Mm. But I, I crushed after that. I'm, I'm not, for, you know, 24 seven as I used to be. Yeah, you don't bounce back as so well after oh, those God. long sessions. 
Mm. Um, cool. All right. So um, just sort of going on about uh, that sort of thing as well. Uh, in Australia, like, you know, you just mentioned you've done a whole bunch of, you know, some really cool gigs, some interesting gigs, uh, and again, really diverse. Uh, I've seen you play uh, recently, actually, uh, before COVID, obviously, uh, uh, at the, the Foundry where you did this project uh, yeah. Carry On Up. The that was a great actually. project. Yeah, it sounded fantastic. Um, but just sort of talking about that, as what sort of like is there a standout uh, recent performance that you have in mind uh, that uh, you've sort of been involved with that you sort of really sort of um, got your creative juices flowing or something that you were really passionate about? Well, that gig was great because um, we only had a one rehearsal mm -hmm. and we did that gig and there was a it was a burning uh, as the three sax players on the stage and it's competitive and. We were good friends, been for a long time. And I'm actually talking to Gary right now. That I said, listen, when's this all this over? We have to resurrect it. It's a great gig, mm -hmm. good musicians. And uh, because it's a funky and you do your, your songs, you think somebody, you know, like we play Gary's song or he plays my one. And it's it was a fun. And I think that that was the, probably one of those things I want to take. And uh, not for money. I don't care about the money in, in, in these gigs. But... It just for myself and for and Gary wants to do it as well and Andrew. So it's it's a fun things to do and when you do it with your friends, it's almost like a jam session. Like you get together with friends, uh, but it's a gig. You get paid for it too, so it's good. Yeah, yeah, and it certainly won't be a moment too soon once we're able to do that again. Um, no, God, don't mention that. It's <laughs> nightmare at this moment. I know, I know. Um, now, uh, obviously, you talked about uh, your teaching. So you've been teaching uh, pretty much as soon as you landed in Australia, and uh, you've been teaching for many, many years, uh, students of all sorts of different levels and different styles. Uh, uh, according to your website, you currently, uh, well, you did mention you still teach at PLC. Yeah. But you also teach at the King School in Parramatta, and you also do some uh, casual saxophone teaching at the University of New South Wales as well. Um, just the tutoring at the union. Just yeah. the tutoring, sorry. Yeah. Um, and just with all those sort of years of experiences and, you know, teaching you know, a very diverse range of levels and uh, styles, uh, what sort of things have you sort of c taken from that to develop uh, for your own teaching philosophy out of there? Like what sort of things do you, at the end of the day, when a student comes out of a lesson with you or, you know, spend some time learning with you, what's, what are some attributes that you hope they take away from lessons with you? Um, Nathan, um, because I came from that um, system where it was in, like institutionalized, mm -hmm. so that was. So I like the A and B exams. I like the Trinity because it has a jazz component for saxophone. Um, so I use both systems, and I play off. You know, the I, firstly when I, when I you know when when the people say, oh, do you have a spot for my daughter?" I, I never say yes or no. I say. Can you please have a meeting? Mm -hmm. And I asked the child um, to play. And I stay, and I need probably like I don't know, three minutes. And I already know what I have to do. If you asked me this 20 years ago, I wouldn't have a clue. Because it comes with that, you know, the, because you have some of my students already like 42 years old and bold. And, <laughs> 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 and uh, that's how long I've been teaching. But the thing is, I, I think that music, it's like a, you go to a, a, a doctor. Mm -hmm. It's very individual. So some people want to play for fun. Some people, uh, the kids, they have a really, they need a direction and they, uh, you know, the, you have to guide them and you have, you have to have exams. You have to have, because they, they need it. If you want to keep them for a few years, then you have to give them direction and you have to give them goals uh, for, um, for younger ones. They, I don't know, the boys, like 14, 15, 16, 17, they, they're looking for, um, because that's when the boys say separating from the family, you're becoming a role model. So you have to be a cool you know, guy and they, you know, they sort of a deal with them differently. And they all want to play jazz. Actually, lately, to be honest with you, I probably 90% of my students are classical. Wow. Yeah. And I have now half and half. I have a clarinet and saxophone. So I have to learn my chops again on clarinet and, you know, playing all of the concertos. Um, so, but it used to be time when it was 50-50. I used to do a lot of jazz saxophone as well. Um, but it's, it's shifting. And it, a lot of kids now like more formal education. 
not just going to listen, just have a fun and learn the, I don't know, careless whisper or something. Actually, I don't have, and I don't take adults. Because I took one guy, uh, he's a Scotsman, uh, ex-Air Force from England. Well, he was good. He had a very nice sterling silver Yanagisawa tenor sax. Mm -hmm. Six months later, we were sitting, and we, after lesson, we were drinking scotch with him. I said, listen, if I start with if every student like this, I'll be an alcoholic. <laughs> So I don't take any more. And the men especially, because they bring all their problems from wives and everything. I said, no, 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 no. I like working with kids. Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I think that what's important is to be able to look at the child and see where they, uh, what does they want, what the parents want, what the child want. And then do you have a, um, a plan for them? Because plan can't be like for a month or two or three or four. It's like for the next three or four years. And then you adjust that plan accordingly when you like see if they progress well. But the, the first impression is always right. When you see the kid, you go, ah, okay, yeah, this is a talented little fella. Uh, some of them are really talented. Some of them you have to wait a year, two or three. I had a student, um, he might be even <laughs> watching now. So I had a, a King's School and he was like an ordinary clarinet player. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, he said, I want to be a sax player and professional. And it's like, whoa, now I, I was teaching him at the UNSW. Now he's a professional doing gigs and stuff like teaching you. I don't know if he's teaching, but he did do different. Uh, so sometimes you have to wait a few years, so, you know, yeah. especially with boys. Girls are more or organized. The difference teaching boys and the girls. Okay. Last week, I'm coming to uh, King's School. Let's call him Andrew. Mm -hmm. Andrew comes. Sir, what time is my lesson? Andrew, in five minutes. Sir, okay, see you soon. Next morning, Andrew, what's happened? What? Well, you didn't turn up to your lesson. Are you sure, sir? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I was waiting for you. <laughs> I must have forgotten. <laughs> Last week at PLC Pimble, I'm coming. There's a two girls at my class. Don't worry, we already switched on the air conditioner. It's warm now there. Uh, I said, what are you doing here? Oh, I'll be swapped out lesson. Don't worry, we already talked to you. Just, that's yeah, fine. And we had a, a cooking class. Would you like to try a warm muffin? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's the difference. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And yeah. yeah, I mean, as you say, like boys sort of, they do tend to mature a little bit later and then they sort of... Exactly. But they... I always tell boys, hey, we went to the moon. Okay? <laughs> Don't worry. We will be fine. We just get it later. Yeah. yeah. It's not about how fast you get there. It's just the, the journey, so to speak. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. Really interesting. Um, now, obviously, uh, I hate to say it, but, you know, COVID-19, it's the, the catchphrase of the year, unfortunately. And, you know, being musicians, it's affected us all in uh, various different ways and things like that. Uh, now, just in terms of for yourself, like it's obviously impeded on your the, the gig scene for you, I would imagine. But um, we were talking before the interview that uh, you actually found there was actually a good opportunity to catch up on some uh, things that you've been putting off, uh, like a recording project that you were talking about. Yeah, um, I'm back in my studio. I'm just actually working right now on a, a new song. Um, I started this project. It's a new album. And started like 10 years ago, but then CDs stopped selling. I think, ah, oh, I'll finish it later. Mm. And I'm good at procrastinating. So it took me 10 years to come back to it. But thanks to COVID-19, I'm back to now and I'm nearly finished. I probably will finish in November. Mm -hmm. I've got a new musicians on this um, album. I've discovered this new website called Air Gigs. Okay. Airgigs.com. Air I can hire anyone in the world for it for not very much money. So for this new song I'm doing now, I have a, I have a drummer from a band called um, Rascal Flats. They're a country band, but the drummer is amazing. They're like a platinum album uh, band in America. And drummer is amazing. John Rayleigh, okay. his name is. And a percussionist uh, also, he played from, I don't know, George Benson to Chaka Khan to George Duke as anyone. Wow. And he's doing for me this. And it's all done on the internet. I don't even go, I just send them the files, they send me back. It's all good color calibrating here. I'm, some of my friends do here as well, they're doing bass for me. And um, it's it's the world we're living in now, it's a virtual. There, there's a lot of bad things about the internet that's happening, but there's a lot of good things. That's the young generation 
who really strives on on internet and they can make a, a killing out of it selling music if you're good at advertising yourself you can you can make it you can make it not necessarily you see these days you're not necessarily sell your music you might uh, I just been approached um, uh, just example I've been approached uh, by one of my um, publishers and he said listen would you consider to do a uh, um, uh, let's call it an album, but it's like a series of uh, compositions that two minutes long. Mm -hmm. um, solo instrument. I said, solo instrument? What do you mean? He said, well, you know how the, at the end of the movie, say, or something, you know, the, the, there's a, the black screen and the, the title's going. So I want, uh, he said, like, I, like, I can see that like a, the sound of a rain and a lonely saxophone playing on the background, sort of like this. So he wants me to do the whole project like this, sort of okay. this. So it's like, a like maybe two or three clarinets playing. Yeah, just the little things. Yeah, yeah. I think, oh, I never thought about it. Well, yeah, okay. So that's the, you have to look outside of a square box. It used to be, I'll just get my saxophone, go to a gig, get paid, go get home. No, nah, not anymore. Mm -hmm. You have to decide you have to chase the gigs, but you have to be a producer. You have to be a costume designer. You have to be a filmmaker. You have to be a photographer. You have to be a CD designer, you know, everything and, and manager and all of this. Mm. So you can't just survive on your skills alone as an instrumentalist. Um, so that's uh, COVID-19 brought me back to the studio. I'm spending a lot of time here and gave me time to, I don't know, do things at home and build my wine cellar, you know, the important oh, nice. for COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully I haven't uh, put too much of a dent and in it. And actually I started practicing a lot of clarinet now, the back, back yeah. to clarinet and saxophone as well. Yeah, start playing my Glasnow concerto and the usual stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. and whenever I practice, I tend to practice more classical now music and boring stuff like close and you know these things, because okay. to, when you when you um, when you're not playing, you need your fundamentals: long yeah. tones, vibrato, you know the all the usual stuff. Yeah, keep your chops up. Yeah, yeah, keep your chops up, and if you give up on it it will bite you when the time starts again oh man you'll be suffering mm. sure. and the good thing is i have a lot of students who's doing like you know the atcl or a a mass l mass so there's plenty of pieces i play with them you know so i have a plenty i play like maybe 20 25 hours a week at least just playing with students that's enough time to already yeah for sure and yes yeah, meaty what repertoire as you were saying as well with those level of students yeah they, they're good one keep yeah. you man some of the especially clarinet stuff man i had to sit down and actually learn the chops <laughs> uh, especially the modern stuff they don't clown it it's like oh god why did you write i just just did the stravinsky three pieces with, with oh, my friend with yeah. my student oh god i said yeah, hey, you play it you play it i'll <laughs> tell you how to play it <laughs> yeah it's not that friendly that piece <laughs> no and i don't want to learn it that's the problem i never played that piece so you play uh, i'll tell you how to play you know you play <laughs> Oh, but um, that, no, that's very interesting because I mean uh, that sort of really sort of uh, reiterates what you were saying before that um, you know being a musician is not just about playing the the music. It really is a lot more to it. It's a multifaceted uh, uh, sort of lifestyle that we have, and um, also just the fact that you know kids these days, particularly, so they're so computer literate. Um, you know, and, and you were saying you know being adaptable to what's happening and. Um, you know, trying to be creative with, you know, uh, uh, with your music and, you know, getting it out there and whatnot. And, you know, the, the computer literate uh, kids of today certainly, um, you know, would be doing things like, as you were saying, like the virtual recordings and things like that, you know, mm. it's definitely an avenue and the collaboration, particularly since we can't do a face-to-face -face thing at the moment. So, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and the kids now, um, I don't see any reduction in the interest in the classical music or playing an instrument for instance i don't see in my what, 30 years of career of, of teaching i don't see any reduction people young people still wants to play an instrument they might play with their playstation at night time or whatever but they when they go to school or when they want to you know they're coming to a lesson they're interested and i find a lot of kids now interested in classical music mm. surprise surprise yeah a lot of them i have a kids who said would you like to learn the jazz saxophone? No, I want to play classical. Whoa, that's good. Let's do it. <laughs> cool. There's a scales book. You start <laughs> on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to have to wrap it up soon. So I'll just do the last couple of questions. Sorry, Igor. But um, yeah, some fascinating stuff. Um, okay. Just a, a little a quick one. Um, if you only had 10 minutes in a day to practice, what would you practice and why would you practice that? Well, I have a two sort of answers to this, to one question. I would pr practice either the boring stuff, long notes, you know, the scale, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Or I will be, I will take a, a part of a song that I need to learn if I go to gigs and just learn that part of a song. That's all. Okay. But most of the times it's just the boring stuff. If I have 10 minutes, it's not enough. So you just go and do your boring stuff. And I like, when I play long tones, I just like walking. It's like a meditation. You know how the meditation go, boom, yeah, that yeah, stuff. Yeah. So that's the same thing. You go, boom, and you just walk. And that's a meditation, a mm. beautiful thing. I know. I, I do the same thing. Like with my mm. long notes, I just, it's a good way to sort of like switch off from what's yeah, going on around you is. and get in the zone. So no, it's cool. Um, now, uh, obviously, Igor, thank you so much for your time. Um, there's been a lot of uh, interesting things in there and, you know, some really fascinating insights into um, a, a lot of things. Uh, so again, much appreciated for your time. Thank you. Thank insights. you for inviting me. Um, now, just before we go, uh, Obviously, when COVID finishes, um, what's a good way for people to find out about uh, co uh, events and things that you would have coming up or uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook? Facebook. Um, I, I don't do much on the, on my um, website, which is eager, igor.com.au, but I will update it eventually. At this moment, I'm not doing anything. You know, the, there's no gigs for the next. I don't know. I, I have no gigs. All my gigs are, um, I had a gigs in October. Everything's canceled. Mm -hmm. So there's no gigs, there's no plans. I'm just planning to finish my album because it will takes a while because I'm doing mixing, I'm doing mastering, I'm doing everything myself. Yep. Um, and I'm enjoying it. I'm not doing it because I'm trying to save money or something. I just enjoy it. Yeah. I, I, I actually I actually tried uh, outsource and did do my mixing, wasted 300 bucks and then did it myself and I did better. So I just learned it. Now, um, I always underestimate myself and I'm, I'm a, by nature, I'm a slow person. Mm -hmm. but I'm a very thorough. So if I sit down, I can, I can do my mixes till six o'clock in the morning. No problem. It just, I have to wake up at seven to go to school. That's the problem. <laughs> true. True. <laughs> but you know, as you say, you, you've probably got a very clear mi uh, uh, thing in your mind of how you want the thing to sound. And uh, yeah, that's, that's probably technically, the technically yeah, there's people who can eat me for breakfast with their techniques, but, Hearing, I can hear things. I know how it's supposed to sound, and I've been doing it for many years. You know, when you do, it's like a, obviously, look, it's kind of like cooking. You might go in fancy restaurant and eat certain certain meal, mm -hmm. but then you go and your grandma cooks, and oh man, that grandma cooks better than that guy because he, she's been around longer. Yeah, I've been you know cooking for the money, and but the grand, so that's when you do it for a long time, you you become good at something. Mm. That that's the thing, you know. That's that's. Take, give it a time so that for younger musicians give it a time give it a go and give it a time yeah and this will be you know suffering there's a days when you you win sometimes instrument most of the time the instrument wins sometimes <laughs> I, I think i'm a mighty one i can play anything sometimes i look at my saxophone and i look at the window and throw the thing out you know yeah yeah there's good days and bad days for sure um but yeah as you say you're right like just persevere and you know you just do it for the passion of it and that's it there's not much money left in music industry, so do it for the passion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> At least they have its joy, you know? Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, for sure. All right, Igor, thank you very much. Um, again, thanks so much for giving so much of your time. Uh, and thank you for those who joined in this evening. Uh, next week, we're going to be joined by uh, Dr. Jim Nightingale, um, who will be uh, our next Q&A guest. So please tune in for that. The date will be up there soon. But um, until then, thank you again. And thank you again to Igor for your time. Thank you. Thank you, guys. See you. Bye. See ya.